Welcome everyone and good afternoon. I'm Leanne Graham, the VP of Marketing here at Pearson. I'm joined here by my colleague Darcy Pepper, who is the Marketing Manager for Pearson MyLabs, as well as the organizer of today's session, as well as our guest speaker, Will McNally, who I'll introduce formally in just a moment. I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us for episode number three of the Pearson Perspectives webinar series. Before we get started, as I've done in past weeks, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that although we're meeting virtually, many of us are indeed on the land and traditional territory of many nations and Indigenous peoples. In this acknowledgement, we'd like to honour this presence, which dates back over 10,000 years. We're exceptionally proud of this series. Um, and as we know, we all feel daily, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has created an unprecedented level of uncertainty for everyone. This impact has been particularly noted in education as many of our customers are going into their second semesters. They finished last semester with a disrupted education system and a rapid move to online. In this uncertain environment, it's really important that learning continues, even if it can't happen in person. Over the last six weeks or seven weeks, I can't remember how long it's been exactly, the team here at Pearson has been working furiously to support students and their instructors as they move online and adjust to the new reality of learning. As I've witnessed with my own children, this is not always a smooth transition. I keep barging in on my son when he's supposed to be listening to his teachers and he's actually looking down at his phone, playing video games, etc. and trying to impart the, the, uh, the importance of paying attention. We've also heard from many in our community that they're looking for answers and information about how to understand the pandemic and what to expect next. And that's really at the heart of what this series is all about. So far, we've learned about economics, tips for managing anxiety, and this week I'm delighted to introduce Professor Will McNally. Will is a professor of finance at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. His research is focused on stock buybacks and insider trading, and it's been published in journals such as the Journal of Financial Management and the Journal of Management Science. Will has also been, and I did not know this until I, I, Darcy let me know, the supervisor of the Laurier Student Investment Fund for more than 20 years. The Student Investment Fund has $1 million under management and is managed by students at the Laurier Business School. Another accomplishment of Will's that's particularly dear to us at Pearson, Will is the co-author of CFO, or Corporate Finance Online, available in Pearson's Rebel platform. Born out of Will's vision of a more applied approach to teaching this challenging topic to students, this is a product that has been particularly groundbreaking for Pearson in the shift to digital learning, and it's been a pleasure working alongside Will, bringing it to learners across Canada and the US. Before I hand things over officially to Will, uh, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, there's many of us on this webinar, um, so I encourage you to use the chat. Uh, the chat function is public, so when, when you start chatting, everyone uh, should be able to see it. Um, if you have a question, we're going to leave time for a Q&A, and that's, uh, that's, uh, we've, our experience has taught us that's been you know, the most interactive part of the webinar series, so we encourage you to ask questions. Please pop them at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a tab that says Q&A. And at the end of Will's talk, uh, Darcy will moderate what I hope will be a lively discussion. So without further ado, I'll hand things over to Will. All right, thanks, Leanne. Uh, the title for this is a little bit cheeky um, because no one knows what's gonna happen. Uh, but what I thought we could do is look at uh, some capital market history to see what's happened in the last 120 or so years uh, and see what we can learn uh, to help guide our expectations and our investment strategy uh, going forward. So let's just review what just happened. Um, we, uh, this is the, uh, a graph of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, we saw it fall 37% uh, uh, from um, uh, mid-February to uh, the bottom in, in late March. Uh, but then remarkably, uh, April was fantastic. Uh, we've seen a 31% uh, uh, rebound in April. Now, the funny thing, uh, you know, is that uh, when you're down 37%, going back up 37 uh, doesn't get you back where you were because the denominator changes. Um, 
March had, uh, what, it was bad, uh, and it had two of the worst days in the last 120 years. Um, uh, March 12th um, was the seventh worst day with uh, a 10% decline. And uh, I remember that day uh, well because we had an in-class quiz that day. Um, just at the beginning of class, uh, 20 minutes, um, and I had some TAs helping me proctor it. And I, I put uh, Yahoo Finance on the uh, projection system. And as the students were working away on the quiz, I watched uh, the markets drop about five or six percent in the space of, you know, an hour, hour and a half. Uh, it was just remarkable seeing it, you know, my financial future disappear and they were oblivious to it. Um, March 16th was, was the fourth worst day in the last 120 years. Uh, it was a Monday, another, another uh, Black Monday. There seemed to be a lot of Black Mondays. Uh, uh, when we look at months, uh, March was, was bad. It, uh, it was only the 19th worst month uh, since 1900. Uh, there have uh, been a lot of bad months. Uh, so lesson number one is that uh, crashes happen. And uh, some people refer to this uh, pandemic as a black swan, uh, the idea being that black swans are extremely rare. Um, that's not right. Uh, we had another pandemic 100 years ago in uh, 1918, uh, and we've had lots of other crashes along the way, and, and, and I'm gonna look at some of them and see what we can learn from them. Um, so the crash uh, would have been much worse if you, instead of owning something like the Dow, which is a portfolio, if you'd only owned single stocks, like uh, here's a graph of Carnival Cruise Lines, uh, stock price that's down 78%. Another bad one uh, is if you owned crude oil, uh, that's down 62%. Uh, and at one point, this is the crude oil uh, futures contract with the June delivery, at one point, uh, uh, in April, that price was negative. Uh, a negative price is remarkable. It's never happened before. What that means is, is that if the contract goes uh, to completion, to delivery, uh, the seller will deliver a thousand barrels of oil and cash. They're actually paying people to take uh, the oil away because of course there's just nowhere to store it right now. Uh, you'll be familiar with that feeling if you've ever tried to sell a couch or a piano. So lesson number two is uh, diversify. Uh, it's difficult to predict winners and losers. Uh, if we don't know the specific source of uh, the, the economic threat, our best strategy is just to hold all the different possible industries and firms that we can. Uh, and for example, with respect to the oil, uh, did anyone forecast that a global pandemic would happen right at the same time that Russia and Saudi Arabia were having a supply fight? You know, that's, that was just a remarkable set of circumstances that just uh, devastated demand at the same time as a, there was a, a huge glut. Uh, the surprise is April. Um, I don't think anyone's uh, expecting the economy uh, to come out of this uh, very quickly, uh, but um, uh, April was the 10th best month since World War II. Uh, here's an interesting table I wanna spend some time on. Um, th this is fund flows from the US. So this is dollars flowing in and out of mutual funds and exchange traded funds. Uh, and, on the, uh, and we've got five different weeks here. So if you look at the far right, um, this is the week ending March 25th, there was a massive outflow. Almost everything's negative. $156 billion left everything except commodities. And that was just a flight, uh, a flight to cash out of securities. But there's some other interesting stories as we move forward. Um, in the weeks that followed, uh, we saw uh, a return to domestic equities uh, on the top row and a little bit of a return to bonds. If you look at the whole period for domestic equities, uh, it's pretty much flat. It's uh, all the money that left in March found its way back in in April and it's, it's, it's about flat for the whole period. But 
world equities or foreign equities uh, were, were devastated. A lot of money uh, ran out of uh, foreign equities. And you can think of that as, as, as um, going to cash or, or maybe going to domestic equities or bonds. So overall, what we're seeing here is a uh, $148 billion outflow uh, out of uh, um, bonds and stocks over the whole period. So people, people were largely leaving securities and going to cash. And that leads to lesson number three, which is don't try and time the market. Um, people who sold in March probably didn't have the courage to buy back in April and missed that bounce. And the fund flow data shows us that that was in fact the case, that there was a lot of money that left the markets um, and didn't come back in April. Uh, corollary maybe of, of lesson three, lesson three A, I called it, um, don't make losses real by selling uh, at the bottom of these, these panics. That just uh, solidifies your loss. Let's see what we can learn from uh, past pandemics. I don't know if you saw the uh, news clip uh, this past week, a, uh, a teen in, in England uh, got dressed up in this um, doctor of the pandemic outfit and, and walked around his neighborhood alarming residents and, and got a stern talking to from the police. Uh, so here's a graph of uh, the Dow um, uh, from uh, through World War I and the Spanish flu. Now these uh, overlapped a little bit, the World War I's uh, yellow, the Spanish flu uh, is uh, blue and they overlapped in the green area. So. Um, uh, World War I ended in late 1918. Uh, Spanish flu uh, started at the beginning of 1918. Uh, and what, what we could see here is that uh, as the war uh, wound down, markets rebounded, but uh, the Spanish flu ended up uh, reversing that. And your best investment strategy with regard to that was uh, to invest afterwards and, and the markets came back uh, pretty quickly and uh, within about three years of um, the end of the Spanish flu, uh, you were up 35%. But uh, buying after the Spanish flu didn't end real well. Uh, this isn't a great period in investment history. Here's a graph uh, from the end of the Spanish flu uh, through to uh, just the eve of the Second World War. And the peak is, is uh, 1929, just before the Wall Street crash. Uh, the gray line is the, is the, is the actually it's the S&P index level. And then the dotted line uh, is, is the compound annual rate of return you'd earn if you had invested right after the Spanish flu. So it rises nicely as uh, the index rises and then plummets with the Wall Street crash and then the Great Depression, which is that gray area and by the end of it, on the eve of the Second World War, you've had a compound average annual return of 3.2% over an 18-year period, which is not a good return. What about SARS? What can we learn from SARS? So this was a recent pandemic uh, in 2002-2003. It looks like markets actually rose during SARS here in the dark shaded area. Uh, but the problem is that SARS uh, overlapped with a recession that started in March 2001. And to address that recession in early 2001, Alan Greenspan lowered interest rates. And then in June of 2001, uh, George Bush uh, lowered taxes. So those, uh, the fiscal and monetary policy there stimulated the economy and the markets and, uh, responded to that. And so I don't think we can learn too much from this. Although uh, if, you, um, if you had invested at the, uh, at the bottom there and held to um, late 2007, which was the eve of the financial crisis, you, you, you had a really good return of 11.6 uh, 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 compounded annually. What can we learn from um, stock market crashes? Uh, well, the big one uh, was the Wall Street crash of 1929. Uh, down 34% in uh, October and November of uh, 1929. But that wasn't the worst of it. Um, uh, here's a longer time period. Uh, the peak is uh, September of 1929. Then we see the Wall Street crash. Uh, it, it rises a little bit, recovers a little bit, but, but uh, falls then for the next sort of two and a half years. And, 
and over the entire three-year period to um, uh, the late 1932, you're looking at an 85% decline in, uh, in the market. Another bad day was uh, Black Monday, October 19th, 1987. Uh, the Dow fell 23% on one day. Uh, and then, of course, the tech bubble of 2000. Uh, so this graph is showing the NASDAQ composite index. And you can see through the, the graph starts on the left edge in uh, early 1999. In 1999 was a remarkable year. The stocks were up on average 129%. And then in March uh, 2000, we saw a drop uh, of 34%, uh, a little bit of a recovery, and then a uh, continued decline for another uh, year, year and a half of, 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 of 68%. This is a, uh, an interesting period to me. Um, I arrived at uh, Laurier in the summer of 1999. I had been teaching at the University of Victoria and arrogantly and foolishly, I took my entire pension uh, and thought I can invest it better than the UVic pension plan. Well, through the fall of 1999, prices rose and, and I didn't want to invest. It, 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 I really worried about overvaluation. And then in March, we saw this precipitous fall. And I thought, okay, this is my chance to get in the market. So I invested all of my UVic pension in uh, NASDAQ shares, tech, tech shares. I looked brilliant for a few months into the summer of uh, 2000. Uh, and then uh, it uh, continued to fall. Um, and in finance, we call this a dead cat bounce, uh, where we get this uh, little fake recovery and a continued decline. And we, we saw that after the um, Wall Street crash, and we see it here again uh, after the, the tech bubble. And you got to ask yourself after the April we've just had, are we in the middle of a dead cat bounce? Uh, as uh, Yogi Berra famously said, it ain't over till it's over. Uh, if you had bought at the uh, peak uh, before the uh, tech crash, it took you 15 years to recover your money. That's, that was my experience. Uh, <laughs> well, I didn't buy it right at the peak. I bought in that little dip uh, in March uh, of, of uh, 2000, but uh, long, long road to recovery. Uh, and it took you 20 years to double your money from that point. Uh, and, and you only hit that spot just uh, a couple of months ago. So let's think about this idea of time to recover. How long does it take you to recover from these things? If we go back to the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street uh, crash, um, if you bought at the peak before the crash, it took you 21 years and seven months to get your money back. Uh, now you might wonder about this graph, that arrow doesn't actually stretch back to a point equal. Um, so this is a Dow Jones price index. If you assume that you're also receiving some dividends and reinvesting those dividends, you're going to have more units. Uh, so the price doesn't need to totally recover for you to have the same amount of money as you started with. So that's the idea there. But, it, it, you know, look at that, 1951. Uh, you, if you invested in 29, you didn't recover until 51. Uh, it took 25 years and uh, 10 months to double your money. Of course, this is just a terrible period in history with the Second World War right smack in the middle of it and, and the Depression. Uh, the financial crisis, uh, if you bought uh, in January 2008, uh, it took uh, only two years and 10 months to get your money back, uh, a little under three, and uh, just over nine years to uh, double your money. Um, Here's a table where I've done the same sort of analysis for all sorts of horrible uh, pandemics and, and crashes uh, and wars uh, for the uh, last 120 years. So if you, if you uh, sort of a list of the worst times to invest here. Uh, if you had invested just before World War I, it took you only uh, 10 months to recover and uh, 129 months to double your money. Uh, your return, uh, on uh, to recover is obviously zero, but uh, the um, return on doubling depends on how long that takes. So I've calculated your, your compound average uh, annual growth rate uh, as being 6.7% to that uh, doubling point. If you bought at the end of the Spanish flu, 
It took uh, 61 months uh, to recover. Um, the Wall Street crash, of course, we went through is horrible. Um, uh, if you bought before Pearl Harbor, it only took 11 months to recover your money. If you bought before the OPEC oil embargo in 1973, it took three years to recover. If you bought just before Black Monday in 1987, it only took 22 months, just under two years to recover. If you bought the summer of the tech bubble, so around August of 2000, which was kind of the peak before it really started to go south, it took 42 months to recover. Before SARS, it only took 21 months. And if you invested before the financial crisis in 2008, 34 months. So the average is, is 30 months to recover and 120 months to, to double your money excluding the Wall Street crash. Uh, I, in those averages, I don't include that. That's just such a uh, horrible period of history. I, I, don't, I don't think we have a lot to learn from that. I hope we don't. So lesson number four is that the market recovers eventually. Uh, be patient. Uh, time uh, reduces risk. Time is your friend. It's, it's when you need liquidity immediately that you create risk for yourself. Uh, so if you're approaching retirement, uh, and you're panicking, uh, don't, um, because your investment horizon is longer than you think. Uh, you don't liquidate all your stocks at age 65. You uh, start to transition your portfolio and uh, uh, move out of the stock market a little bit, and that process happens uh, slowly uh, as you, uh, as, as you uh, uh, well, after retirement, let me phrase it that way, um, and, you, and you can choose you know, when you do that uh, judiciously. So what's next? Uh, wrapping up. Um, uh, here's a graph from Robert Schiller um, that looks at uh, valuations. How uh, expensive are stocks right now? Uh, and and what, what can we discern about where maybe they're going to go? So this is a graph. The, the blue line is the price earnings ratio. So when stocks on average are expensive, this blue line is high and uh, relative to earnings. And when uh, stocks are cheap, relative to earnings, uh, the blue line is low. Uh, and then the red line are long-term interest rates because of course valuation and interest rates move inversely. So we can see that uh, valuations hit two peaks, uh, important peaks in 1929 before the Wall Street crash and again in 2000 before the tech crash. Uh, and what we're seeing now is uh, that uh, the P is around 25. So it's nowhere near its all time high. Um, and you know, it is gonna be high because interest rates are so low, but you, you still get the sense that valuations uh, could uh, fall uh, pretty substantially and uh, still not be regarded as historically abnormal. So I don't know if this makes you feel better or, or not. Uh, valuations are not crazy right now, that's for sure. Uh, I, now here's the, here's the crazy part. Uh, what if you asked me to forecast uh, where the market's gonna go? Um, so the black line is the S&P 500 graph to uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, and uh, what I did with the red line is I thought, well, if this is an average recovery, uh, it'll be about 30 months until we recover the peak that we hit. Um, so that'll be at some point in uh, early 2023. Uh, and I also put a, a dead cat bounce in this picture. So uh, I uh, tried to show kind of a worst case scenario where it drops down, but then finally recovers. Uh, and then the gray line is uh, just about another year or two longer. So uh, about a five year uh, recovery. Uh, and, and so that would put us uh, back uh, where we were in January in, in, uh, in about five years. So I, I think our future is somewhere between these two lines. Uh, you know, I was told once never uh, to, um, when forecasting, never provide a level and a date, always one or the other. I've, 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 I've provided both, but I, I think I've hedged my bets. 
So with that, I'm going to stop and uh, turn it over and uh, see if there are any questions. Hi, Will. Yes, we have um, lots of questions that have come in so far. And there are uh, there is an opportunity if you, you do have questions for Will directly, just sh uh, put them into the Q&A uh, at button at the bottom of the ribbon. Um, the first question, and I think that you kind of already um, touched on this, but just, you know, you, you've talked about it at the end, like if you had to, to, to guesstimate of how uh, long this recovery will take, um, what, what's your sort of your best answer to, to, the, to that, like forecasting how long it's going to take for, for the uh, stock markets to recover? Yeah, I think this graph is is my best estimate at that. Uh, I think I think we hit about three thousand four hundred on the S and P five hundred. Uh, I can see us getting back there by twenty twenty three to twenty twenty five, but I'm not too sure what happens next. I mean, are we going to see a dead cat bounce, or are we going to see the markets kind of just fluctuating wildly? Uh, there's, you know, there's still, we still have to process what's happened. We don't really understand the business implications of what's just happened and, uh, and the, the government uh, finance implications. Okay. Um, there's a question here about uh, the domestic equities. It says, Will mentioned that purchases of domestic equities bounce back in March and April, but I see world or foreign equities remain negative. Uh, so people kept selling. Um, what's the difference between activity in the domestic versus international equity trading? So that table, I mean, I'll go back there. Uh, this table is U.S. data. Uh, so these are all um, U.S. mutual funds and uh, U.S. Uh, exchange traded funds. And, and by world, what they mean is that would be a, a U.S. mutual fund or ETF that buys foreign country stocks and, and a domestic one is just buying U.S. stocks. And so what I'm seeing here is that people dumped their uh, foreign mutual funds. So if you had uh, EFIs, Europe and East Asian funds, or uh, if you were in um, uh, Chinese uh, equities or, or South American, it looks like people were dumping those. Um, kind of a flight to safety, I think. The, the thinking being that the US economy is the strongest one, uh, so it's got the best chance of, of, of surviving this. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, you're not really sure at this point uh, what's gonna happen with some of these uh, developing nations. Um, okay, there's a question here about, um, oops, sorry, another question just came up. Um, okay, so it says firms with stronger balance sheets and essential companies can survive this. Do you believe there will be overinvestment in such companies and portfolios will be less diversified? Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting uh, point. Um, there's nowhere to go right now with your money. You know, yields on bonds uh, are, are infinitesimal. Um, my, th my thinking was that with all these governments um, borrowing so much, it would push yields up as they compete for investor dollars. But we've got quantitative easing happening. We've got the Fed and in Canada, the Bank of Canada, actually buying some of the bonds. So we're not seeing any pressure on the bond market to increase yields. So where are you gonna invest? You're gonna invest in publicly traded equities. And uh, those are those same stocks you just talked about. And uh, that, that could push those valuations up. Um, maybe that's what we're seeing in April. Uh, it, I, but, but since there's nowhere else to go, I don't see that crashing. And I don't know if it hurts diversification too much. If you have um, a big basket of stocks, like I've, I, I buy the S&P 500 
index and, and I get a BlackRock product uh, with a ticker symbol XPS, which uh, puts you into this ETF that gives you all 500 of the shares in the S&P uh, and it's Canadian dollar hedged. So you're, you're protected against the currency changes. And I think, you know, the Canadian dollar is going nowhere but down. Um, that's, that's what I'm into. And that's, I think that's pretty well diversified. So I don't know that this is going to hurt diversification too much, but I think your point is that, that it's, um, that, that we're going to see, maybe valuations are going to stay strong, uh, because there's just nowhere else to go. Okay, so I think this is a little like a follow up to that point because you were talking about uh, portfolios um, and diversification. So for those that have not yet done anything um, with their portfolios uh, during the pandemic, they've just sort of stayed the course. Uh, would you recommend continuing with that strategy or is there something that people can do right now to uh, improve the, their investment uh, position? Oh, good question. So uh, I've been, I've got a friend uh, and we've been Zooming and just talking about the markets and uh, investments and, and he basically liquidated in March. Uh, and um, uh, he, he has not gotten back in. So he missed April. Uh, so I think if you did nothing, um, that's what I did. It was horrifying. It was really horrifying. Uh, I, it has caused me to rethink when I might retire. I, I don't know that that's going to be, certainly not going to be sooner. Uh, now, um, if you've got some cash, um, this is interesting. You know, I, I have uh, had a little bit of cash because I, I did think the market was a little expensive uh, through uh, 2019. Um, and I've done a little bit of buying through this. I'm very wary about the dead cat bounce, but I think the last question makes me wonder if, if you know, maybe we're, we're going to see stable but volatile fluctuations or stable valuations, but volatile. And that would put us maybe more on this kind of gray line, but imagine a lot more volatility around it. Um, so, you know, may, do a little bit of dollar cost averaging, try and, and buy on little dips. Um, I don't, you know, that it could be a good time to get in the market. You're, you know, you're, if you've got a long investment horizon ahead of you, if you're, you know, younger than me, I'm in my late fifties, you know, you, you can wait, right? You can, you can afford to be a little bit wrong. You can afford to invest a little bit uh, at various points in time along the next few months. And if we, if we see a, a bigger decline, leave it there. And uh, I, you know, 10 years from now, uh, this is gonna be ancient history. 20 years from now, this is ancient history and you don't care. So you, but what you don't wanna do is start investing money now that you might need uh, in the short run, that if you have mortgage payments or car payments or some some obligation kids going to school and you need that liquidity, uh, I would not depend on this market right now. Okay, so I think this question again uh, relates to what we what you just spoke about, um, and and it's uh, you know it's about dips. And, and the question is, are we likely to re revisit the March lows as the real extent of the economic damage becomes visible, i.e. bankruptcies and downgrades? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's kind of my red line <laughs> on this graph is, is I just don't know if everybody's wrapped their head around how much damage we're doing to the economy right now you know, at the beginning, we were talking about a V-shaped recovery. We are not going to see a V-shaped recovery. Uh, you know, small businesses are going to be devastated. Uh, and, you know, those, those businesses might have a month of slack. Uh, they basically go month to month. Uh, if we talk about extending this uh, lockdown into the end of, um, of uh, May, we're going to see um, uh, the small uh, restaurants, uh, small businesses start to fold. So that's going to hurt the economy. That's going to hurt employment. Uh, 
I also think, you know, when you think about public equities, um, I can't see consumer discretionary stocks doing well in the near term. Uh, I, you know, I think what we're going to see is people increase their savings rates uh, because this has put the fear of God into them. Um, so they're going to cut back on consumption. I think we're all being more uh, careful with uh, and frugal, uh, you know, not throwing out, uh, away uh, food, uh, not uh, uh, sort of being quite as disposable. So um, I, th I think the consumer discretionary is, is uh, the whole sector is going to be very slow to recover. Um, uh, you know, any of the travel companies, um, I was just uh, looking at a website. Uh, I, I guess I could share it with you. Could I not? Can you, can you, are you guys seeing this website or are you still yeah, seeing we can, my... we can. I can see it, Will. Okay. So this was a, I just randomly looked for, search for consumer discretionaries and this is someone's top 20 consumer discretionary stocks, just to give you a sense of what types of businesses these are. Norwegian cruise lines. I, you know, I can't see anybody going on a cruise anytime soon. Um, MGM resorts, I, 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 you know, holiday travel, I think is going to be reduced. I don't, no one wants to fly. So airlines, um, if we, if you, if you travel anywhere, I imagine you're probably going to drive and keep it domestic. Um, uh, who else is in here? Harley Davidson, those kind of um, uh, extravagant purchases, a motorcycle or a sports car, forget about it. Um, uh, well, Hasbro's toys, uh, I think that'll be fine. But Expedia Group, uh, no. Um, down here in this table, Chipotle, Mexican Grill, I don't think people are, are, are going to be dining out anything like as much. Uh, more, more eat in, uh, and, and then those restaurants are, are probably going to have to cut their seating in half. Um, so yeah, any of these stocks, Nike, um, Athletic Apparel, um, I, I just don't see these recovering quickly. Um, so these would not; these would be companies I would, uh, you know, if you were if you were picking and choosing your sectors. I would not choose this sector. My approach is, as, as I told you, is, is just a broad, broad diversification. There's been a couple of questions about um, some of the other um, pandemics that you've referenced. And for example, the, the 2018 crash, just with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic affecting so many uh, sectors of the economy, is it a different type of crash to uh, some of the other um, some of the other pandemics and downturns that you referenced in the presentation? Uh, yeah, well, different in, in two ways. Um, like if you go back to the Spanish flu, um, we didn't have the communication, we didn't have the public health, we didn't have uh, the data, the testing, um, the hospital facilities, so the death rates were way worse, way, way worse. Uh, so that just destroyed, you know, the World War I uh, destroyed uh, almost a generation of men and then anyone basically who survived it then was, was killed by the Spanish flu. But the economy didn't stop. Um, uh, although the employment and labor force shrank. Uh, so we, we, if you go back to that graph, it was kind of climbing out of World War I. Um, and, and, uh, and, and the Spanish flu obviously hurt it, but it didn't destroy it. Uh, um, whereas, an, you know, what we see with the lockdown is, is just uh, we are destroying this economy. Um, and you, you can't just turn it back on like a switch. All these small businesses um, who fail, you know, think of all those, the gyms. I, I, was, a, I, I was a member of uh, one of these neighborhood uh, gyms with the one hour workouts. Well, I'm not comfortable going back and doing that, breathing heavily in close proximity to other people and, and, and using the same equipment. Um, 
they're going to they're going to fail, and then those owners aren't going to have enough liquidity to restart their business, and they're not going to be able to rehire the trainers who work there. So we're going to see uh, sustained wounds uh, from uh, this that are going to take a while to to work through, um, and and our our behavior is going to change. I, I think this is going to affect us a little bit like the Great Depression. I don't know if you have any like grandparents or anyone that you knew that lived through that, but uh, you know, those people really had a different attitude. Uh, like I, in fact, it's the difference between my wife and I, she, she's like a squirrel. She keeps everything. And I'm, I'm, I'm and I'm, and that's cause her uh, grandparents, uh, really, and, and, and her parents grew up in, in World War II England. So there was a, a family culture of, of being uh, careful and, and, and saving. And, and I, I, I'm much more clear everything. I throw it away, whatever I don't need, I'll, I'll go and buy. So I, I think we're gonna see a return to that kind of frugality, maybe less um, conspicuous consumption. Uh, you know, one thing that happened after uh, the, the depression was uh, people, uh, it, was the, it was when jeans got popular, blue jeans, because uh, people didn't want to dress ostentatiously in public. So even uh, wealthier middle-class people would wear the working class uh, clothing. So I, you know, I could see stuff like that affecting luxury brands. Um, uh, so yeah, this, this, is gonna be, this is gonna be a slow workout. Okay, well, um, I'm just gonna ask one more question just before we wrap up here. And uh, thank you to everyone that submitted questions. I tried to do my best to sort of summarize them um, in the same sort of uh, theme, but if we didn't get to your question, I do apologize. The last question is that there are uh, a lot of students on this, on this um, webinar, and there's been some questions about uh, what advice would you give to students right now who, who want to just sort of dip their toe in, um, what, what would you suggest uh, investing in um, if you could just give them, uh, you know, a, a little bit of advice? What would you tell your students? Well, um, what I do is I buy these index units. So I'm buying the whole market and it's a nicely diversified portfolio and that gives me diversification. Uh, that's smart if you're saving for retirement. If you just want to play the market uh, and start stock picking, um, that's that's very risky uh, right now. Um, we, like I said, we it's hard to think through the implications of this. Uh, you you know who's going to do well? You have to think about all the stuff that that you're going to want to do in the next year, year and a half, uh, like already, uh, you know, who's done well is Netflix, Disney, uh, because, uh, you know, we're all just streaming like crazy. Um, but you want to be careful if you're just going to buy one stock, you don't want to buy, you know, something that's going to blow up. Uh, J. Crew just went bankrupt, uh, the, uh, the clothing line. Um, so it, it, uh, if you just want to get a bet on a stock, uh, I wouldn't bet on just one at this point. Maybe make several bets and get a little bit of diversification. Uh, buy on some dips. Uh, just be patient. Um, uh, we had a nice little dip. Uh, was it Tuesday? I did a little buying. But again, I'm buying the index units. Um, if you want to, if you want a, a, a sort of a crazy bet on the market, the, there are some exchange traded funds that magnify the market. So if the Toronto Stock Exchange is up one percent, these things are up two percent, and there's all uh, there's also inverse uh, versions of those. So if the T TSX is down one percent, uh, this thing's up two percent, moving uh, twice as much in the opposite direction. So that would allow you to, to bet on market timing, but that's really tough. Oh my goodness. Uh, I, am, I, I do not do that. I am not brave. Uh, I have no good sense of where it's going. Um, so I think maybe just thinking through the economic fundamentals might be uh, more intellectually interesting uh, and, and possibly more rewarding. Okay. Well, 
thank you everyone for your questions. Uh, we're going to save all of the questions and uh, see if we can coerce Will into answering some of them for our website because I know there's uh, some good ones uh, in here that, that we didn't have time to get to. I appreciate the, the talk, Will. There was a lot in there. It was great to see uh, the historical context. I, I also didn't realize that we called that a dead cat uh, bounce. So that's that's uh, something I'm going to be quoting liberally in, in conversation for the next couple of weeks for sure. Uh, so we really appreciate it. And thank you to all the attendees. We, we are delighted to host you again this week. Next week, we're back with episode number four. Uh, we have Lisa Salem Wiseman, who's, who's from Humber College, talking about communicating during a pandemic. So very important, another very important topic. And uh, with, without further ado, I'll close things off and everyone have a safe and healthy afternoon and enjoyable evening. We'll see, hopefully see you next week.